So welcome all to the Akatink Unitarian Universalist Church live stream worship service. I am Reverend Alexa, and I'm happy to be leading this service today. Akatink UU Church is welcoming and inclusive. It's a community that seeks to create a more just and compassionate world through our actions to bring about justice and by honoring the web of which we are all a part. All are welcome here in this justice-seeking, earth-healing community of faith. You are welcome no matter whom you love, no matter your identity or heritage, no matter your beliefs or background, no matter your means or abilities. You are welcome here in this religious community. We also welcome the ancestors and descendants. We welcome the people who made each of us, the biological ancestors, spiritual ancestors, teachers, and guides. We welcome those who imagined and made our congregation possible. We welcome the ancestral people of this land and recall that our church, like all of Burke, rests on the unceded territory of the Manahawak tribe of the Great Sioux Nation. We need healing with the people of this land whose body and spirits live on in their descendants, many of whom are members of the Monacan Indian Nation, the Patawamak Indian Tribe of Virginia, and the Biscataway Indian Nation. We honor the ancestors as we move towards healing so that all the descendants together shall one day know full justice. With this, let us welcome the longings and hopes and tenderness of all the descendants that we might live for them today. I now invite Sheila, our worship associate today, to continue our welcome. If you're new to Akatink and would like to talk more about this church, please be sure to reach out to me, to our minister, or a member of the board. Contact information is posted on our website at www.akatinkuu.org. On our website, you can check the online order of service on the worship section of our webpage. While you're there, be sure to check our events page for upcoming virtual gatherings and other news. I invite you now to close your other windows or apps and devices Take a deep breath and center yourself for worship. I light this chalice in the name of breath. Breathe into the light that is always here, always you. 35 of us. Breathe into the warmth of that light, the warmth that is you. Rest into your light of wisdom. Rest into the warmth of the light of compassion, moving through you, through your hands, your words, your actions. Feel the warmth and light that is you, your being, your awareness. Rest body, mind, and spirit into this light and feel renewal. Rest body, mind, and spirit into this warmth and let it comfort you. This is a call to worship for the joyful, the brokenhearted, the exhausted, and the Fearful by Reverend Christian Schmidt. For whatever you are feeling right now, may this be a place for you to find what you need. You are welcome here in this gathering where we come to feed our souls, heal our hurts, and just be together. For too long now, we've experienced the things that divide us, poverty and oppression, unjust laws and policies, violence and imprisonment. We cannot fix these in a day or even a year, but we can fix them and we must, because we know that despite divisions, despite the triumphs or defeats of candidates and parties, our destinies, all of them remain deeply intertwined. 
Liberation must be for all people if it is truly liberation. As long as one soul suffers needlessly, we cannot rest. As long as our planet screams out in pain, so will all who live on her. So for all the feelings, the emotions, the pains and hurts, the joy and celebration you have in your heart and body and mind today, you are welcome here. Here, may you find rest and renewal, partners for the journey, time to contemplate, and energy for action. Let us worship. We have a reading today by Bell Hooks from the book All About Love, New Visions. One of the best guides to how to be self-loving is to give ourselves the love we are often dreaming of receiving from others. There was a time when I felt lousy about my over 40 body, saw myself as too fat, too this or too that. Yet I fantasized about finding a lover who would give me the gift of being loved as I am. It is silly, isn't it? That I would dream of someone else offering me the acceptance and affirmation I was withholding from myself. This was a moment when the maxim, you can never love anybody if you are unable to love yourself made clear sense. And I add, do not expect to receive the love from someone else that you do not give yourself. I recently had the pleasure, the deep, deep pleasure of traveling to a new place, a place I hadn't been before. The trip involved an airplane, and that, of course, involved wandering around an airport. I felt renewed from the first step into the airport. And I'll tell you what I saw. I saw people. I really saw them. I ate them up with my eyes. I saw an elderly white woman, a woman with some round edges who used a walker. She was coming out of a restroom and her eyes were red. Were her eyes bothering her or was she crying over the joy of seeing loved ones? By her side was a little girl who had long brown hair and was so dressed up. You know me, I'm a crier, don't worry about it. She was even wearing a mask that matched her dress and she proudly carried a little tiny girl-sized purse. And I saw a really tall black man, yeah, he was tall. I saw a white man with tattoos covering his arms. You know, the ones they call sleeves? And if I'd been close enough, I could have told you what story they relayed. From afar, it looked like there were dragons and maybe there was a battle. He had a beard and a certain haircut that's popular now, though since I've been outdoors so much recently, I wasn't familiar with it. Near him was a young woman who looked to be Hispanic, having trouble with her flip-flop. She was wearing a colorful dress and had a bow, or maybe it was a flower in her hair, and she carried all of her weight with confidence and, frankly, a bit of swagger. I saw them, and I loved them. I found my heart pouring out love towards them with a deep sense of connection and appreciation for each of them. Then I wondered, is that old woman okay with her eyes being so red? Do they hurt? Is she self-conscious about that? Is she okay with using a walker or has our society's ableism led that to be a hardship for her? How does she feel about being the age she was, which was old, proud or resigned or longing for a different time in her life? I wondered about that little girl. I hoped I saw a spark of spunk self-love there that was with that matching outfit and her obvious connection to her grandmother. But was there some part of her, some part I didn't even notice that was something she wanted to change about herself? Was she growing breasts earlier than some of her friends or later? Was there something else she didn't love about herself? And Mr. Tall Man, how are you with that? Was being tall as a child good for you or were you teased and like my friend, who's very tall, constantly asked if you played basketball. Were you hounded by that question? Does our world accommodate your height well, or are you constantly bumping your head and feeling squished in cars and airplane seats? What about the man with the tattoo? Were they a sign of self-love? Did he wish he was more, mm, 
or less, mm, I don't know, but I do wonder about him. And then the Hispanic woman with the shoe problem. How are you, my dears? Do you feel worthy your worth with every step, whether your shoe is broken or not? Whatever your height or weight or hair color or lack of hair, or the presence of lots of hair, whatever your color or ability or age or youth, I hope so. I hope you feel your worth. I pray you feel your love for yourself, acceptance and delight, that you feel totally fine with your too much mm, or your too little mm, the parts you think are too much or too little and that maybe, probably, society has long told you were too much or too little. The forces that say you aren't enough are huge. The forces that make us hate ourselves or parts of ourselves are enormous. They want us to change, to morph and manage and conform. I could give this sermon about ageism, anti-youth bias. I could give it about ableism or racism or classism or a bias towards those whose first language is English or mm, any other thing, you get it. But this sermon is about bodies and weight and size and the way that fat people are taught not to love themselves or even like themselves very much. In this sermon, I'm gonna talk about food, bodies, um, those bodies relationship to society somewhat differently from the way many of us have been taught. I assure you, I have researched the heck out of this topic, and I literally have fit footnotes sprinkled throughout my text with references to scientific studies supporting all that I'm about to say. I use the word fat intentionally. People use the word fat to mean something mm, ugly, failure, lazy, dirty, gluttony, stupid, or worthlessness. That is not what fat means. Fat is a descriptor and is Brianne Colston, director of Brown Girl Recovery says, I reclaim the word fat in all spaces, formal and informal, because I get to. I get to shift what was once used as a mechanism to break my spirit into something that offers a source of power and pride. It's a reminder of all that I've come from and all that I will do when I use the word fat. I also want to be clear that I understand that the whole topic of weight and fat can be triggering. Probably the most for people who've wrestled with societal, familial, and personal expectations about weight throughout their lives. I'm sure that there are some recovering or even living with an eating disorder right now here. If you think this sermon will be too much for you, I understand. And whether you stay or go, I am happy to talk after this service with you. I think Quan is putting my contact information in the chat about now. So this is a sermon about self-acceptance and self-love and fatness. As you've all learned, we in Unitarian Universalism translate what we hear in a sermon to make it relevant to us. So maybe for you, it will be less about weight than age or ability or something else. Feel free to translate it into discussing any part of you that society says is inadequate, not ideal, something that society has always told you to change about yourself. I hope you can do that. <clears throat> We've all been told by friends, doctors, and most all, the, always the media, and corporations making a lot of money off weight, two things that aren't true. First, weight loss or gain is a simple matter of calories in and calories out. Second, that being overweight is really bad, terrible, in fact, for health and longevity. So let's look at those two fallacies. Great thanks to Dr. Linda Bacon for her seminal work entitled Health at Every Size, The Surprising Truth About Your Weight. Researchers have conduct, concluded that 70% of weight variation can be accounted for by genetics, making the heritability, that is the, the part that's genetically connected, of obesity greater than almost any other condition, including breast cancer, schizophrenia, and heart disease. We know that through that, through experiments where one identical twin was told to exercise a lot or given a lot of food and the other wasn't. The result, result showed that the weight gain or loss tied them to their twin, not to folks who were on a similar exercise plan or food plan. In other words, as I said, genetics are a huge component in how food is metabolized and how exercise impacts weight. 
each of us has a weight set point and that hard set point is hard to move in a downward direction. Authors based at the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Disease studied the data on 29 long-term weight loss studies. They showed that after weight loss, more than half of the lost weight was regained within two years. And by five years, more than 80% of lost weight was regained. Put another way, most studies that claim to track long-term weight loss success define success as keeping five or 10% of the original body weight off for only a year or two. And many studies have shown that after weight loss, your body weight set point may indeed increase. In other words, in the words of Linda Bacon, who I might mention holds a doctorate in physiology and a master's degree in exercise science and a second master's in physiotherapy and is currently an associate nutritionist at UC Davis. Diets are a setup for failure. Even the more sensible diet plans commonly encouraged by healthcare practitioners, it really isn't your fault that you can't keep lost weight off. Your body is simply doing its best to protect and support you. In fact, weight gain happens even when the newer low calorie diet is maintained or the increased exercise program is retained. Even eating hundreds of calories less than before they started to diet and exercising more, folks were regaining this weight that they had lost. If you've ever dieted, you may well have experienced this and certainly popular TV shows such as The Greatest Loser, oh my gosh, show that rebound weight gain often to a higher weight than before is the norm. And now another fallacy, being overweight, even obese doesn't pose the health risks we often think of. Did you know that overweight people live longer than normal weight people? And yes, obesity isn't overweight, but the excess deaths in the obesity category were clustered in the more extreme, extreme range, body mass index of greater than 35, which is not where the majority of obese Americans fall. They're in the 30 to 35 range. Some of you know I'm a former data wonk. In fact, I've done a lot of consulting for various institutes of the NIH. In my first career, I managed large surveys and wrote reports on our findings. Isn't it interesting that a major CDC report published a number of years ago, which got lots of press at the time, got their death analysis wrong? They originally said that a huge number of Americans die of overweight and obesity each year. But they had to reissue the report. And let me say the reissue didn't get anywhere near the press of the original issue to acknowledge that the analysis suffered from computational errors. Using better methodology, a little bit newer data, CDC epidemiologists reduced the excess death expectancy 15 fold. That would be like you saying, we're having somebody over for dinner and 15 people show up. Determining that obesity and overweight were associated with far few deaths than guns, alcohol, or car crashes. Despite these data, the medical community's general reaction to fat people is to blame them for being fat. Obesity, we're told, is a reflection of personal weakness that makes us ill and shortens our lives. That's why the fear of becoming fat or staying that way drives Americans to spend more on dieting every year than we spend on video games or movies. 45% of adults say that they're preoccupied with their weight some or all of the time. Nearly half of three to six-year-old girls say they worry about being fat. Did that little girl coming out of the restroom with her grandmother worry about that? Sometimes I don't think we even know how unrealistic what society wants us to look like is. For instance, the average model is hardly a healthy role model. She is five feet, nine and a half inches tall, and weighs 123 pounds. And often she has so little body fat, she can't menstruate. And the models and stars you see in magazines may well have had their images photoshopped in absolutely unrealistic ways. Fat erased, signs of age erased, arms or legs lengthened or waist or buttocks shrunk. It's actually scary to see what is done to photographic bodies, particularly women's bodies. And those bodies are accepted as typical or desirable and attainable. Norway has even passed a law against publishing retouched photos without a disclaimer. 
that is an example of how unrealistic and simply false portrayals of human bodies, mostly women's bodies, are in the media. Slowly, slowly, some parts of the media are moving in a better direction. Did you know that Pinterest just banned weight loss ads? The National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance argues, and rightfully so, that fatness is a form of body diversity that should be respected, much like diversity based on skin color, sexual orientation, or identity. But the weight loss industry in our society are determined to put us on a diet. I think much of that is about making money from us. Our society is obsessed with thinness, and so are we. Let me give you some numbers. The diet industry was worth $72 billion at the start of 2019, and the fitness industry is worth an additional $97 billion. I don't think these industries are benign. Rather, they are selling fear and self-consciousness and self-loathing to make their buck. They are selling what is often for some definitely an impossible dream. And impossible dreams that are based on self-hate aren't benign. They need to be called out. Don't we as a denomination side with love? Yes. And this demonizing of fat needs to stop. So now let's get to what our cultural origins might tell us about bodies and individuality, individuality and fatness. This is a nation formed, at least in part, on puritanical values. I feel that much of our societal attitude towards work, sensuality, and yes, food can go back to that origin story. Could our national anti-fatness campaign have to do with our national origins? Or let's look at this from a theological perspective. We could call this the theology of bodies. I took a course on queer Jesus, queer Christianity when I was in seminary. And this paragraph popped out at me from my professor's writings. His name was Hugo Cuero. He wrote, the reality is that people of faith usually believe that God's work is to punish those who deviate from the normal, which is determined by certain interpretations of morality, Bible readings, and theological views. These sources construct reality for human beings, but also for job, God's job description. Most of us you use don't subscribe to that definition of God or God's work, or maybe any definition of God, but almost all of us have been exposed to that type of belief. So maybe there's a seed of that self-condemnation that has been planted in your heart by your past faith or the friend you had as a child and went to, to church with occasionally. But for sure, one of Unitarian's founding fathers, William Ellery Channing, was a big believer in, quote, perfectibility, the perfectibility of human nature and behavior. Channing insisted that God takes pleasure in making human beings happy and finds joy in encouraging the infinite progression of human beings and towards the moral perfection of their souls. Hmm, could that get interpreted as like being sin? In the context of the wrong-headed facts I've already shared about these weight loss, doesn't the concept of perfectibility sound like a bit of a trap? All of which gets us to exercise programs and weight loss programs. I am not anti-exercise. I look back really fondly on the summer I was working hard on my next belt in Taekwondo of my time. <clears throat> as a dancer of the many hours I spent doing laps in the pool, because I just enjoy it, of ice skating, and years and years that I spent doing yoga. I love to move, and I don't want this to sound like I don't support athleticism, walking, and just plain moving for fun. I'm good with goals for exercise and training up for an event like a marathon or a sweet swim meet. But did you know that that 10,000 step goal that many of us have pursued like the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow was not scientifically derived and actually came out of a marketing scheme for a Japanese pedometer in the 1960s. Today's best science suggests we do not need to take 10,000 steps a day to live a long life. See what I mean about these arbitrary goals that someone else sets? Let's have fun, enjoy movement, focus on what feels good, maybe even push hard, towards hard goals. But let's not subscribe to arbitrary targets set by somebody 50 years ago, or even worse, 
goals set by exercise and weight loss programs. So why am I so critical of for-profit exercise and weight loss programs? Well, they're profitable, but that isn't a sin. The real problem is that their message both creates and attempts to address a sense of inadequacy, fear of not being desirable or having the right body. What they're really trying to sell is healing and meaning, though they are in part part of the reason that healing is needed and meaning needs to be refound. In so many pockets of American culture, folks turn out to work, go to workout studios and programs to be happy and to answer questions about life and its meaning. Fitness brands and diet programs try to become both a social identity and a code by which to lead your life. Think SoulCycle, CrossFit, <laughs> though they certainly aren't the only ones. I'm sure we could each come up with another. The fitness movement creates customs and rituals, social expectations, and consequences for failing to show up. People meet their closest friends and spouses in the studio. True diehards quit their jobs and become instructors themselves. Amanda Montell, in her book Cultish, writes, over the years, fitness studios have really learned, leaned into their churchly role that they play in members' lives. SoulCycle's website actually reads, SoulCycle is more than a workout. It is a sanctuary. Publicly crying, eulogizing lost loved ones, confessing wrongdoings, and testifying to how the group has changed one's life are customs regularly found and embraced within the studio walls. I want the next breath to be an exorcism is among the supernatural catchphrases soul, structure, soul cycle and structures preach, and I use that word intentionally, in class. It's when elements of belonging, self-worth, and empowerment enter the picture that members are moved to renew their fitness memberships year after year. Montel, whose book again is named Cultish, goes on to say, fitness is a particularly compelling form of self-improvement because it demonstrates classic American values like productivity, individualism, and commitment to meeting normative beauty standards. The language of cult fitness, be your best self, change your body, change your mind, change your life, helps connect aspects of religion like devotion, submission, and transformation to secular ideals like perseverance and physical attractiveness. There is even a church, the Remnant Fellowship Church, whose whole premise is weight loss and weight control. It's a Christian church. The lead minister, Gwen Champlin Lara, promotes a religious-based weight loss program. Just to tell you how controlling and puritanical this program is, it hardly mentions standard nutritional principles, but instead it focuses on a reliance on God and urged members to eat only when their stomachs growled. As you might expect, the program shunned church members who didn't lose weight as the plan promised. So I'm winding down here, but I've, I've got to say that, that one of the sayings about ministers, and maybe you've heard this, is that they have one sermon that they preach again and again. This is a sermon unlike any I've preached before. And at another level, it is just exactly the message of self-love, radical self-care, authenticity, and non-conformity to norms you didn't create or consciously buy into that I have preached again and again. I don't buy the idea that if you don't succeed in becoming the picture of flawless fitness, if you don't acquire a six pack or a Gwyneth Paltrow body and the inner peace that you deserve to be unhappy, that I don't believe that you will then die unhappy or will die early. I hope you don't either. I know the words of Diane Silvan are true and deep down, we all know it. You cannot hate your body into health. Years from now, we will look back on horror in horror at the counterproductive ways we address the so-called obesity epidemic and the barbaric ways we treated fat people. Much like the way our societies had a reckoning with racism, Me Too, or anti-LGBT laws and policies, we will, as a society, eventually change. And those changes are long overdue. Think of the pain we have put ourselves through needlessly and the harm we have consciously or unconsciously done to fat folks, including some of us. And yes, I'm talking in part about the COVID-15 that some of you are worrying about. Do you know that doctors even put pets 
on weight loss diets? For what? So their owners can be proud of their svelte bodies and trim form? Aren't pets just supposed to be happy companions? And if leaning in towards love and acceptance and science for ourselves isn't enough, let us think about the next generation. One of the best indicators of how grandchildren interact with food and their own bodies is how the adults in their lives talked about their bodies. Remember that large proportion of kids, young, young kids who worry about being fat? Blessed be, Ashe and Amen. Though we will extinguish our chalice flame, we carry within us what we kindled, the light of inspiration, warmth of compassion, the fire of commitment. May we bring these gifts into our lives and show them radiantly out in the world. I invite you to join me now in our community blessing with these words of David Bumba. This church is dedicated to the proposition that behind all our differences and beneath all our diversity, there is a unity that makes us one and binds us forever together in spite of time, death, and the space between the stars. We pause now in silent witness to that unity. Today's benediction is by Sean Neil Barron. Your belt body is welcome here, all of it. Yes, even that part and that part. And yes, even that part. The parts you love and the parts you don't. For in this place, we come with all that we are, all that we have been, and all that we are going to be. Our bodies are constantly changing. Cells die and cells are reborn. We respond to infections and disease. Sometimes we can divorce them from our bodies and other times they become permanently part of us. Your body and all that is within it, both wanted and not wanted, has a place here. Our bodies join in a web of co-creation, created and creating. Constantly changing, constantly changing us, scarred and tattooed, tense and relaxed, diseased and cured, unfamiliar and intimate, formed in infinite diversity of creation. Your body is welcome here, all of it. So take a moment and welcome it. Take a moment to feel in it. Take a moment to be in it. Thank you. I want to share a final thought with you. I've been with you now for a year as your pastoral care minister. In that role, I've not only provided pastoral care to some of you, but I've worked closely with your wonderful staff and uh, pastoral care team. I not only got the pleasure of working with all of them, including your minister, but I also got the chance to lead worship once a month through the church here and a bonus of two extra sermons in July. Now it is time to say goodbye. This has been such a great year, despite the obstacles and distance, Zoom and, and my part, my very, very part-time status. It's been a great joy to get to know many of you, work with many of you. As I saw the names coming in on the uh, participant list, I thought about conversations I've had or ways that we've interacted. Ah, and all the tech folks, please, please pass the word back for any who aren't here. How much I, and I know all of the, all of the people leading worship appreciate the technical uh, skills and dedication that you've given. Thank you. And then most of all, thank you for your welcome and for being you. You have been strong this year. I'm a crier. And I know you will welcome Reverend William as warmly as you have welcomed your past ministers and me. This is a sad goodbye, but a good goodbye as well. Adios and amen.